Uh, I get a lot of emails as a result for internet ministry and also being on the radio, TV, and the different uh, venues that we have of trying to get the word out. And I've been having an exchange with somebody about uh, really the topic is following Jesus, as he calls it. And uh, he just can't understand why we uh, don't believe we ought to follow Jesus. And I tried to show him that we do follow Jesus through following the Apostle Paul. And so tonight, I just wanted to do a little bit of a study on uh, do people really follow Jesus? I think most of you know that the answer to that is no. Uh, but let's start in, in Matthew chapter 4. And uh, notice there in, uh, in verse 12. In Matthew 4, verse 12, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zephulon and Nephthalim, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zabulon and the land of Nephthalim by the way of the sea beyond Jordan Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death light has sprung up. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So there's no mistaking what Christ is teaching there. He's preaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and that's exactly what he told the twelve to preach. Now, uh, as he in verse 18, And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. Now, obviously, these men that, that Jesus Christ called, we, they show up uh, over in Matthew chapter 10 uh, as his disciples. And his initial call to them was in verse 19. He said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, that's, I think, where people a lot of them get the idea about following the Lord, following Jesus Christ. And yet, when you really study the Bible, it becomes evident that people today are not following Jesus, particularly in the manner in which the twelve did. Uh, look over in Matthew chapter 19. In Matthew chapter 19, in Matthew 19, uh, there's a couple of uh, instances recorded here in Matthew 19 that are important. And I'm going to read it uh, without a lot of comment. Uh, but we're going to start in verse 16. Now, it's interesting. You know, people, they want to follow Jesus until you get right down to the nitty-gritty and show them the things that it would require in order to follow Jesus after the flesh. Which, as I said, people might say they're doing it, but nobody's really doing it. My dad and I used to have a lot of discussions and we would talk about things in regard to the Scripture. And uh, inevitably, he would say, well, I, I believe you ought to follow Jesus, and I would always take the words of Jesus, you know, those red letters, over what Paul said. Well, that's, uh, that's the way people are today, and that's what people's attitude is, and it leads to great confusion. Uh, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, Behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. 
He saith unto him, Which? And Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Now notice the response. Jesus said unto him, If, if, Thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Notice, and come and follow me. Now notice the response. When the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. In other words, it was literally impossible. Because what did he just tell the man? He said, in this particular instance, go and sell that thou hast. And the man went away sorrowful. Uh, let's continue. Uh, well, in verse 23, Then Jesus said unto the disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and again I say unto you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Now notice Peter's response. Then answered Peter and, Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? So number one, if you're going to follow Jesus Christ in the same manner in which the twelve followed Jesus Christ, number one, you're going to have to forsake all that you have. I don't know anybody that's done that. Uh, and it wouldn't work today anyway. Uh, but that is why in Acts chapter 2, 3, 4, that they were willing to sell their possessions, lay them at the apostles' feet, because these people were familiar, many were familiar with the teachings of Jesus Christ. And following Jesus Christ, it could, you know, it was a matter of completely selling out literally in all areas of life. Notice what he says. Peter answered and said unto him, Behold, we've forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now notice, And every one that hath forsaken houses, our brethren, our sisters, our father, our mother, our wife, our children, our lands, for my name's sake, Receive a, shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. And by the way, those verses are probably uh, not only in reference to the immediate time at that point, but were uh, an admonition about what was going to happen in the tribulation. Because you think about a man that takes the mark of the beast. He has to forsake all. And he says there in verse 4, 30, many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So the reason that people get this mixed up idea that they can follow Jesus is because there's a lot said about following Jesus. What people do not do in most cases is actually read the Bible and see that they in no way are following Jesus as he instructed his disciples to in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They just don't do it. And so it's important that we rightly divide the word of truth and understand how today that we can follow Jesus. Look over, if you will, to Romans chapter 15. In Romans 15, in Romans chapter 15, verse 7, Wherefore receive ye one another, as Christ also received us, to the glory of God, now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the Father. So number one, the ministry of Christ was not to Gentiles anyway. It was to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
and he was a minister of the circumcision. But Paul says in verse 16 that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Look over, if you will, in 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians 4. Now there's an interesting uh, thing here in 1 Corinthians uh, that really people need to understand. uh, Because in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is rebuking the Corinthians about following men. And he says there in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto babes, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal, and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Paulus, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers, by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? So, you read that in relation to Paul saying, you shouldn't be following after man. But then you get over to the next chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And verse 16, Paul says, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Well, why is the change there? Well, look down in verse 11. He says, Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst, and are naked and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place, and labor working with our own hands, being reviled we bless, being persecuted we suffer it, being defamed we entreat, we are made as the filth of the world, and are the offscouring of the things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you, for though you have ten thousand instructors in Christ, Yet have ye not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. You see, Paul wanted them to follow not him in the sense of worshiping him, but think about this. He says, we're fools for Christ's sake. He said, we hunger and thirst, we're naked, we're buffeted. Be ye followers of me. In other words, Paul said, we... We, we labored working with our own hands that we might be able to provide. These, Paul was an example unto these people, and Paul desired that they followed him. Now, there's many aspects of Paul's ministry which we cannot follow today because Paul did things in the early part of his ministry that later we see that he instructed people not to do. For example, uh, there was a time when Paul said that people ought to not eat meat if they cause their brother to offend. But when he, wrote to the Colossians, when he wrote to the Colossians, he said, don't let anybody judge you in respect of meat or drink or any such thing. So the, the point in all of that is, is there is a difference uh, in Paul's early ministry, his late ministry. And yet he says here, be ye followers of me. Now, look over in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In 1 Corinthians 11. We're told exactly how we're to follow him in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And he goes on to say, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances that I delivered them to you. So Paul says, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Well, how did Paul follow Christ? He followed him according to the doctrine, the revelation that he received from the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Paul didn't follow the Lord in, in uh, uh, the manner that the twelve did, but he followed the doctrine that was revealed to him through Jesus Christ, the revelation of the mystery, and so forth. Uh, look over in Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5. In 
in Ephesians 5. Well, back up there to verse uh, chapter 4, verse 30. He said, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Uh, and then notice the next statement, chapter 5, verse 1 Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. So, how is it that today we can be followers of God? You see, a lot of times people get the, uh, uh, they get the grace message and they get the understanding of salvation by grace through faith and the liberty that we have in Christ Jesus. And they, they just kind of go wild with that and don't realize that we have the responsibility of following God. He said right there, be therefore followers of God as dear children. Well, how are you going to follow God? Are you going to follow him in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? You going to follow him in the book of Acts, or are you going to follow him in Romans through Philemon? Well, if you're going to do it scripturally, you're going to do it in Romans through Philemon. And there's several things said uh, in reference to uh, following the Lord. Look in Philippians chapter three. In Philippians, a few pages over there. Philippians chapter three. Again, Paul says in verse 17, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. Now notice, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversations in heaven from which also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So God desires that we grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, but be followers of Him. And that does not mean joining the church, being baptized, repeating prayers, or anything like that. To be a follower of God is impossible today without following the instruction of our apostle, the Apostle Paul. Uh, notice what Paul says in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Now this is a very important passage, and it speaks to several things that people need to pay, take heed to. Uh, notice there in verse 12, We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. And notice the next statement, And are over you in the Lord, and admonish you. When a person desires the office of a bishop, and he takes that responsibility, as it's called in Scripture, a bishop or a pastor, that person takes that responsibility and in doing so, he should have the full support of those that he ministers and pastors. Now, if the man goes off track doctrinally, uh, he needs to be corrected. But it, it, and it's not a blind following. I'm not talking about that kind of thing. But as long as the man is teaching the Word of God, and I, I can truthfully say that I, I have a wonderful and deep appreciation for those at Grace Bible Church, because... While we may have had differences over the years, doctrinally we've been on the same page, and those people have respected my position as pastor, and uh, to the extent that sometimes people make comments like, well, we have a pastor-run church. Well, we, we don't really. We have a board of elders. It's 
The reason, only reason we do that is because uh, we own property. But the, the thing is, is that the, the Scripture here makes it clear that those that minister in the Word, he says, they labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Well, what should be your attitude toward those people? I esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Now, you can't do that when you go behind their back and try to uh, undermine what they're trying to do and, and try to destroy their ministry or to, to cause them not to have the ministry that they want to have and so forth. That is in rebellion to the Word of God. You see, there's a lot of areas of life where we need to follow God. We always think about it, you know, going to church on Sunday, giving our tithe of our money, and don't go to bad movies, don't say, you know, cuss words, don't drink too much liquor, don't smoke cigarettes, don't do drugs. But come on, there's a lot of things that pertain to the ministry in the body of Christ, and even in the local assembly, that have to do with following God. And this is one of them right here. And uh, I have no qualms whatsoever in, in preaching this kind of thing to our people, which I do, because they should respect me as their pastor, as their overseer. And if they don't, then they should find somebody else. But, uh, you know, as I've told them before, they didn't hire me and they can't fire me. Now, they can quit paying me, but uh, I was preaching for nothing when I got there. So I don't guess it'd make a big difference. But anyway, notice what he says. In saying all of this, he says there in verse 15, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good. Follow that which is good. You see, it's always easier to follow that which is bad. And when you're in a local assembly, you need to be careful. I was just on the telephone today, spent over an hour with a man that was talking about some people in his fellowship that had gone behind his back, tried to undermine the ministry and so forth, and how deceit, deceiving these people were uh, rather than just confronting the issue. Listen, if anybody's got a problem with me, they, they should come to me. If they got a problem with the person, if you got a problem with the person that teaches you, go to that individual. Don't go behind their back and get on the telephone and make calls. I don't know how I got off on all this, but anyway, the, the, I don't, what I'm trying to demonstrate, folks, is that there's a lot of ways in the Scriptures that we are to follow God that we give little thought to when it becomes inconvenient or not what we want to do. So follow God, and to follow God, remember what Paul said, if any man be spiritual, let him acknowledge the things that I write unto you, or what? The commandments of the Lord. We've got some commandments, and we ought to abide by those commandments as believers, as grace believers, and rest in what Christ did, but realize we have a responsibility of following God. Not following Jesus in his earthly ministry, but following God. Not only that, look in Romans chapter 14. In Romans 14. You know, I have never asked our church uh, to do anything ministry-wise that they refuse to do. Uh, they they have had respect for me as their leader, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. But on the other hand, I've never done anything underhanded. I've never spent one penny without their consent. And uh, they know that they can, when they give their money, that it's going to go toward the ministry. And they have confidence in me. I hope all of them do. Uh, but the point is that they're not just following me. They're doing that because they know, according to the Scriptures, that's the right thing to do, is to follow the Lord, follow His Word. And if I'm going contrary to the Word, they shouldn't follow me. But as long as I'm going according to the Word of God, they should follow me. Just as Paul said, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Then in Romans chapter 14, look there in Romans 14, uh, in verse, well, let's, let's just cut in here in verse uh, verse 15. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. 
For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that is in, for he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Now notice, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Now that's a great thing to follow. <laughs> Follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. Uh, Nothing can hurt a local assembly more, or even a Bible study or anything else, than people going behind the backs of one another, gossiping, backbiting, and so forth. Well, you know, the preacher didn't do this, and he didn't do that, and he didn't come see me when I I didn't respond like I thought he ought to respond. Well, that's just, I mean... That there is no value in that. Follow the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. That's what our ministry as believers is. Much of it is the edification process of one another. Look in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. You see, we have the ministry of building one another up, and yet so many times Christian people, saved people, Grace believers spend their time tearing one another down. And that just certainly shouldn't be. Uh, That should never be the case. Uh, Paul says there in verse uh, uh, 11, Ephesians 4.11, He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now notice, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sight of men, and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in the him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. You see, he said up there that the, the teachers were given to for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now notice in verse 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself, in love. You know, been having air conditioner problems lately and I was out there with the repair man the other day and he had the air conditioner all tore up outside there and we began to try to he, he began to try to test parts. And I'd say, well, what's that part? And he said, Well that's a conductor and the power has to be twenty four volts coming to there and that kicks on the compressor. And the compressor runs and pumps the freon through the coil and the air blows across the coil and that wire tells the fan or or, or has a sensor that it tells the fan when to turn on and so we replaced that compressor still wouldn't come on and so he put his gauges back on he said we're still not getting 24 volts well there's a little board over there and that board was a short a, a circuit to keep the compressor from kicking on immediately after it goes off it's a delay to save the compressor and it has a five minute cycle on it so he went and bought one of those and replaced that. And then there was a uh, another relay around there. And then there was a, I forget what he even called it, that was rusted over. And I got to thinking about all of those little individual parts. One, and it was that one little board that had two little wires going to it that shut the whole thing down. In addition to that, you've got the wires that run inside to the thermostat, and the thermostat wires go back out. And all of that stuff is compacted in that one unit, and when it's all working, it really functions well, and it keeps your house cool. But it doesn't take but just one little short circuit in one of those boards or one of those relays or one of those wires. We even replaced the wire from the upstairs unit where the coil is all the way down to the compressor because he said if that wire broke through and was touching a piece of metal it was shorted out and every time we'd turn it on it'd blow a fuse up in the a fan area 
the, and as I was talking to him, and this man's a Christian, we I began to talk about how that air conditioner reminded me of how the church is to function. And we talked about Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, I, I thought about how so many times it just takes one person to upset the apple cart. It just takes one person in there being negative or or being uh, uh, you know uh, against the preacher or against the teacher or against somebody else in the assembly. And, you know, it's interesting to me how much of Paul's epistles are written about us getting along with one another. And it's no wonder Paul said, follow the things that make for peace. Follow those things. Charity, the fruit of the Spirit, love, edification, all of those things. Uh, look in uh, that same chapter there in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, where we were reading there, I'm not, not Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 14, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 14. Of course, chapter 13 is what people call the love chapter, but it's actually the charity chapter in the King James Bible. Uh, but after all that Paul says about charity in 1 Corinthians 13, notice what he says in chapter 14, verse 1. First three words, follow after charity. Follow after charity. And then look over in 1 Timothy chapter, because we pretty well covered that. Let's go over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy 6. Follow things that make for peace. Follow after charity. And then Paul says in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6. Notice there in verse 11. 1 Timothy 6, 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and notice what he says, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. You want to know what to follow after? Follow those things. Seek those things. Follow after love. He said, Thou, O man of God, follow after righteousness. He's not talking about self-righteousness. Follow after righteousness. I understand that the righteousness we have is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. God made him to be sin for us, that you know sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I understand that God made you, spiritually speaking, righteous before God. And he desires that our out, the outward manifestation of him and his life in us should be what it is inward the love he, he says follow after righteousness godliness godliness most of the time in your bible has to do with acknowledging of the truth not always but many times paul said uh in titus chapter one that he was the godliness uh acknowledging of the truth which was after godliness and then he says to follow after good uh, faith love patience and meekness Look over in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2. Second Timothy 2, verse 22. A similar re uh, reminder. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. So you see, folks, just because we don't believe in following Jesus after the flesh doesn't mean that we're left without anything to follow. We have a pattern. Paul was the pattern of our salvation. And we have the doctrine that tells us that there's some things that we ought to follow as members of the body of Christ, and there's some things that we shouldn't follow. Number one, we should never follow our flesh. Why? Paul said, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Don't ever, don't ever be misled into believing you ought to follow your conscience. Paul says that our consciences many times are seared with a hot iron. Your conscience is not always lined up with the Word of God. So don't follow after the flesh, because in the flesh dwelleth no good thing. Don't follow your conscience, because... It can be seared. It can be uh, directed in the wrong way and driven by your emotions and your feelings. 
And anytime you allow your emotions and your feelings to dictate your walk as a Christian, you're going to end up following your flesh. You see, most of the time, what you're instructed to do for God is not what feels good, feels like the best thing to do. Uh, I mean, when you wake up on Sunday morning, it always feels better to stay there in bed. But if you got a fellowship to go to or a Bible study, then you ought to follow the instruction of the Word of God, and that is to edify one another. Follow things that, that, that bring about edification and peace. Don't follow your friends. Don't follow your family. Uh, there are people that uh, recently have left our assembly, and uh, I, I don't know exactly why, but I think it has probably to do with their family and the friends they're associated with, and they got tired of you know, the negativity that these people have about the grace message and that kind of thing. Well, follow after these things. Don't follow the flesh. Don't follow your friends. Don't follow your family. Don't follow your conscience. And by all means, don't follow the traditions of men. Jesus told the Pharisees, He said, You do teach for doctrine the commandments of men. Now, there are some traditions that are nothing wrong with following. But there are some that are absolutely contrary to the Scripture. You think about the things today that go on in the, the church. Why is it that people are taught to tithe? Well, because of tradition. Uh, I had a Baptist preacher tell me years ago that he started preaching in 1930 and didn't know a single Baptist preacher that preached that the tithe was for us in the dispensation of grace until after the Depression. And so then it got a hold of there, and people began to teach it and use the Old Testament Scriptures uh, and so forth. That's just a tradition. Does the Bible teach giving? Yeah, it doesn't teach tithing for you and I. Uh, the tradition of, of giving an invitation at the end of a church service, the tradition of uh, uh, all these other walk in the aisle, the tradi- water baptism, say, well, that's scriptural. Well, no, it's a tradition in the church because Paul made it clear Christ sent me not to baptize. And on and on it goes with the traditions of men. And there are some of the traditions that we follow. For example, meeting on Sunday. We meet on Sunday because that's the day that most people are off and, and everybody else. It wouldn't matter to me if we met on a Friday night, Saturday night, or Sunday. But if it's more convenient Sunday, don't worry about it. That, but that's a tradition. Some traditions are not bad. Some are not harmful. But many are harmful and detrimental, particularly when they are conflicting with the truth of the Word of God rightly divided. I hope these things tonight have been a blessing to you. I know that it's kind of been all over the place. But I want you to understand, folks, it's a wonderful thing to know that you're saved by the grace of God. If you've trusted the, the gospel, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, believing he died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day, then you have the word of God and you have something to follow. Paul said, be ye followers of me, even as I am of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't follow all the things that Paul did because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, I became all things to all men that I might win some. And so, the fact is, is that we follow our apostle, and in so doing, we follow the Lord Jesus Christ, and we follow God Almighty. Thanks for being with us tonight.